the person I want to introduce right now is hard to introduce without using the name Jerry in the description. So I want to introduce to you an amazing entrepreneur and engineer, Jerry Ellsworth. Big round of applause. Hey, everybody. Um, so this morning I woke up and I thought, like, I'm just going to grab my presentation from VCF East and use that. And uh, so I started hunting around my computer, Google Drive. Am I the only one that can't ever find anything in Google Drive? And uh, all of a sudden I started getting panicked because I couldn't find it. It's gone. So then I'm like, OK, we've got to turn this around some way. So I started looking at other presentations that were floating around. I found this one from Dent the Future, which is a pretty cool event. Um, but it's going to have some weird stuff in here. So it's, um, it's the, this will be the second time today that I've looked at any of the slides. So um, I don't know. Feel free to uh, ask me questions along the way. And plus, I got a free um, plug for my startup, because that was the first slide in it. Um, I'm going to start off just talking about, you know, what a weird kid I was and why that's relevant to retro computers and probably get into, uh, you know, how my stuff is becoming retro, which is really weird. <laughs> really weird. Um, so, you know, you go all the way back to when I was a kid. I was the super nerdy kid interested in science from a super early age. You know, I was taking apart everything in our house um, at probably the age of five or six, as soon as I could get into my dad's tool cabinet and uh, start using the screwdrivers, things started coming apart. And uh, that was really frustrating for my father. He'd scold me, you know, don't open that. What are you doing? You're going to break it. And a lot of things I did break. Which <laughs> and, you know, as a kid, you try to hide these things, too. So. And of course, being like five, six, seven, eight years old, you're not good at hiding you know, your uh, misdoings. And uh, so there was a lot of tense moments uh, with my father. But he was, he was very understanding um, about my passions. And that was really cool. Um, I think today, as I talk um, through things, I'm going to talk about mentors. And really, uh, my father was my first mentor. Um, he was raising me by himself. Uh, my mother died when I was one. And um, he did the best he could being a working father. He owned a gas station in a rural town um, out, out in Independence, Oregon. If you've ever been out there, you'd, if you drove past it and blinked, you would miss it. Um, but you know, he tried his best to like, find resources for me to teach me about science and technology. and. Uh, he was bootstrapping this business as well. So he had moved, after my mother died, to this small community, saved up all of his pennies, sold his Corvette collection, which now I'm mad that he did that, but, uh, and, and um, bought his way into a service station gas station. And so um, as much of my childhood, um, I would just be hanging out at the gas station with him, watching him wrench on cars. and. Um, Money was tight, too, back then as well, because he's trying to bootstrap this business, and all of every penny he had was in it. And that was, it was great to see entrepreneurship early on and see the, the, the sacrifices you have to make um, when you're doing that, which also led to me to be prepared to make some sacrifices later in my career. Um, but since he had this gas station, there was some really cool things that, um, he did. Since I like to take everything apart, he put a box out front with a sign on it, bring your broken electronics. Yeah, I see someone pointing. Yeah. I mean, that's the best way to learn. Take stuff apart. Like, even today, I take everything apart. So um, that was wonderful. So every month or so, a big box of nasty, greasy toasters, you know, broken toys, old um, tube radios and stuff would show up. And in those early days, I would just take them apart and scatter them all over my room. Um, and 
And uh, I, I didn't understand anything about what was going on, and this was part of the discovery process. You know, but I would take them apart, like resistors, capacitors, things like that. I would just bend them back and forth and break them off and just kind of start segregating them and sorting them into different piles by how pretty they looked. <laughs> so I had a, a great leadless uh, resistor collection at the time and capacitors and stuff. Um, that was pretty cool and fun, but um, you know, as I got a little bit older, I started getting more advanced like electronic toys, and I'd start taking those apart and inevitably breaking them. But there was like this turning point where small things started happening where I would take something apart, it may have a green LED in it, and I figured out how to put a red LED in it by twisting wires together and stuff like that. And I started to to understand a little bit about how these things work. Like you put an LED in one way it lights and the other way it doesn't. It's like, it was still kind of black magic to me, but I was starting to develop this intuitive feel. Um, I gotta say this one, I, because I think Bill brought it up recently. I gotta talk about my first soldering iron because I wanted a soldering iron badly, badly. And, you know, being eight or something, my dad was afraid I'd burn the house down. And uh, he's probably right. Um, so I found that you could take a wire wound resistor and hook it to an AC wall wart and plug it into the wall. It'll smoke like hell at first and then you'll see the wires glowing down you know, the core of this thing. But the leads are made out of steel so you could solder things with it. And of course my dad had like probably some plumber's solder so I had this big fat quarter inch solder and I started soldering things. Well, that was all great and everything because you know there were times I could do this when my father was like at work or something and, and he wouldn't smell the smoke. But one day, you know, of course, you don't have a soldering iron stand to hold it in, so I have it like propped and glowing cherry red up on like my um, little desk, and it flops off into our old like shag carpet on the floor, and burns a resistor outline into the carpet. I'm like, oh shoot, you know, and I'm trying to scuff it and hide it, but it was. It was gone, that carpet was gone at that, that spot. So, you know, of course, being a devious little kid, I try to hide it as long as I can and put stuff over top of it. And eventually, Dad sees it, and he's like, what the heck happened here? <laughs> and I had to come clean about it. And he's like, okay, I'm gonna go get you a soldering iron. I'm gonna teach you how to use it. I want you to use it when I'm around, which of course I didn't. And I w took me to Radio Shack. Oh, I love Radio Shack. <laughs> and got me my first like $9 um, soldering iron made out of cheese. Um, <laughs> you know, the tip, you know, those tips on those things would turn black and erode away instantly. Um, but that was really cool, it was awesome. I'm so glad that he was supportive to do that. And um, you know, I started getting a little bit better at building things. So I'm a child of the 80s, um, was born in the 70s, but really started having like memories of the 80s. So you know, things that were really influencing me were things like the space program, you know, the shuttle, like, oh my God, space. I wanna be an astronaut, of course I wanted to be an astronaut when I was younger. Arcades were booming back then. You know, any time I could go to like a pizza parlor or an arcade and my dad would give me like two quarters to get, you know, here's two quarters, go have fun. Um, I'd hang out in the arcades, I'd, I'd scope out every single arcade machine to decide which one I was gonna put my quarter into, watch all the other kids play. It was a great experience, a really great social experience that I miss today. Um, home video games were big. Um, we didn't have home video games at our place for a long time until I got older and my dad made me work for these things, which was, Frustrating, frustrating. But one thing my dad did do is um, uh, nurture um, my interest in computers. So one of the friends of the family had a TI-99 4A, and as soon as we went over to visit that, my eyes were just locked onto it, and I just had to try it out. And they were very generous and let me play on their TI-99 4A, of course, I didn't know anything about how computers worked, so I sat at a basic prompt for hours while the adults did their boring talky-talky thing. But I would sit there and I would type on the keyboard, draw house, syntax error. 
paint, house, syntax error, but it was great. I didn't care, I just sat there. Uh, eventually, like after the second or third time uh, going over there and just making a big mess on the screen, um, family friends came like, hey, there's this book that came with it. They didn't know anything about computers. They just needed to be part of the computer revolution, so they bought one. And they're like, here's this book, maybe it'll help you do something. And so, super fond memories of typing in Mr. Bojangles from the TI-99 um, manual that came with it with a little guy that, that danced like this. And I was hooked at that point. Um, so I asked my, or I begged, I begged and begged and begged my father, please, please get us a computer. And so, you know, he wanted to do that even though money was tight. And he would take us by the Sears and Roebuck and the Montgomery Wards and let me walk up and down the aisles and look at all the computers. I immediately fell in love with one computer. Wanted it so bad, I'm like, Dad, Dad, please get me a VIC-20. And he's like, why? Because the letters are so big. <laughs> I thought that was a key benefit. And so he did, uh, he didn't get me that, he actually got me a Commodore 64, which um, I'm thankful that he did that. And, um, you know, my dad liked to do surprises for events like birthdays and stuff. And I had all this time alone in, his, in the house, and I was forbidden from going into his bedroom. But of course I did, right? And so one day I go in there, and I'm rummaging around his closet looking at things, and I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, a computer, a computer, a computer, a computer. And I'm like, well, he's not going to be home until 6.30 tonight. So I pull the thing out, take the sleeve, and I got, there was a disk drive there too. So pull the sleeve off the disk drive, smell that smell of methacolates or whatever it was, you know, and sneak into the living room and screw the terminals off and screw this thing in and um, turn on the computer and going through the manual. And I, so for probably two months before he actually gave it to me, I was taking it out, hooking it up, putting it back. <laughs> and then at my birthday, I think it was my birthday, he comes in and he's like, here you go, kiddo. And I'm like, oh, I'm so surprised. <laughs> yeah, so that was really great. And of course, I didn't understand how computers worked, um, but he had bought a, cartri a couple cartridges, Donkey Kong and Moon Patrol. And so I played those things to death, um, programmed on it, figured out how to save my first program to the sample disk that came with it. You didn't buy me any disks with it. <laughs> and I used the free 10 blocks on the disk up immediately. Didn't know how to format or do anything or delete. Um, yeah, that was really wonderful. But he, he bought me these cartridges. And to me, they were just connections on the cartridge port. So obviously, I can make my own video games if I just make the right connections in the cartridge port. So I would jam forks and knives into the cartridge port, and beautiful colors would show up on the screen. Um, so sorry to the Tremiel family. Um, I ended up breaking two or three of these that went back for RMA. Um, but <laughs> it was kind of paying it forward. I'm <laughs> hopefully I'll do something with my life. And uh, <laughs> um, so my dad, uh, you know, he's like, the goddamn C64 is a piece of shit. It keeps burning up. And so he takes it back, and like after the second or third time, he comes back with the plus four. Sexy. Oh, my goodness. This thing was so futuristic looking. I loved it so much. And, so, and it was so great. It had advanced basic in it. it. didn't have all these crazy poke things I can do. It was the best computer for me at the time. Thank you, Bill, for... Um, creating that because, you know, that gave me um, ability to do a lot more with it. I built, had a built-in machine language monitor, so I started to, although I had no clue what was going on inside of it, you know, I started to get an intuitive feel of how the machines actually worked inside. Uh, at the same time, uh, my dad had bought this for my half-brother, like 161 in electronics kit. This was great. Um, so this, I was learning at breakneck speed how electronics worked. And I spent so many hours working on this, this kit. I wish, I wish uh, every kid today had one of these, whether they use it or not, just so they get exposed to something like this. 
And around this same time, I'm probably 10 or something at this point, having a great time with my plus four, old enough that I could start helping my dad at his gas station for $3 an hour. Woo! And um, I, at the same time, I ran into another mentor. So this was actually a slightly older boy that lived up the road from me. We lived way out in the middle of the country on this gravel road, but he was into electronics and more advanced than I was. He had a kit like this as well, and he was making AM transmitters. And I'm like, wow, that is really, really cool. I want to make a transmitter. So he showed me the page. I built one. And we ended up having this arms race between me and him. He was about a half mile away. We build our AM transmitters, and we get on our bike with our little transistorized radios and pedal down the road. And we would measure how many phone poles away from our houses. And um, he would go get a, a power transistor from Radio Shack, save up and like for weeks to buy a $15 transistor or something ridiculous, put it into his circuit, and then I would save up and I'd get a transistor and put it in there and it would just smoke immediately. Like, Ten dollars out the door. Um, but then, you know, we start figuring out how to do stuff with tubes. And so our AM transmitters started getting more powerful and more powerful and got to the point like on a Saturday or Sunday, we couldn't ride far enough to, uh, to get to the end of the range. Surprised we didn't get a visit from the FCC. We were lucky, we were probably out in the middle of you know, boondocks. And uh, uh, so then we moved to FM, which was more challenging. Um, so that was a lot of fun uh, doing that. It, he was also kind of a phone freaker and got me introduced to the phone system and so had a great time uh, playing around with the phones. Uh, started learning a lot about the phone system and I think that's probably pretty relevant for this crowd since phone freaking was so big here. I was a little late to the um, 2600 hertz days but um, our little local community had old relay-based um, phone systems, so you could do a lot of fun things with it, like go park on somebody's phone line when you call them up and just never leave and harass them every time they pick the phone up. And um, I made uh, some really cool circuits. Actually, my first telephone ever you know, was built on this, so I figured out how to get the impedances right to be able to scream into the little speaker and have people hear me on the other side. And if you remember rotary dial phones, uh, I figured out that that was actually making and breaking a connection. So I hooked the relay up and the little Morse code key and I could dial from it. I hated everyone that had phone numbers with zeros in them. <laughs> yeah, um, I think my favorite phone freaking thing is I made this really cool circuit where um, I could pick up the phone immediately and the, um, it wouldn't even ring. You wouldn't hear a ring on the other side. And I hooked it to the remote um, control on a uh, little Radio Shack tape deck so I could play back messages. So I would call up like a wrong number and get the doo doo doo. You've dialed a wrong number. And I'd call my friends and like prank them and they knew it was me. So then they would call back and it would be like doo doo doo. This number has been disconnected. Or please insert 25 cents to make this call. I had all my friends in like junior high convinced that I was, you know, I had total control over the phone system. <laughs> um, I threw this picture in way back when, when I did this presentation. Movies that influenced me, Star Wars, I'm Star Wars nerd, Star Trek, holograms, and that leads to kind of where I am today. It's like, I believed we would be talking to computers. I believed we would have holograms just super optimistic kid, and here we are, we're pretty much there. Um, so, you know, I get a little bit older, and, you know, this is frequently, as a kid, what my uh, workbench looked like, you know, just debris everywhere, got very advanced in my electronics, making peripherals for the Commodore 64, got into Amiga computers, and, um, um, just, it was just such a great time to be a nerd, however, you know, now I'm in high school, and this is when, you know, the wolves come out. And, you know, the kids around school realized that I was a very sensitive nerd that could be picked on, and I would cry very easily. And so I was viciously attacked. It probably started, in it was junior high, too. But um, I was the kid that was just beat down on constantly. 
And this was kind of a rough patch for me because of all of this. But everything kind of changed um, in this one moment. Like, okay, talking about my father and mentor, um, this is important too. Um, he always um, took a positive attitude about whatever was happening, if it was, even if it was really shitty. And that kind of sticks with me today. Like, I'm getting picked on as a kid, and I'd come home, like, distraught. And he's like, you know, you're tougher than them. Doesn't matter what they say. Whatever they say just rolls off you. Think of it this way. If they're picking on, the, on you, they're leaving somebody else alone because you're tough. So I'm very thankful that he did that. But it came to this point uh, where I snapped one day. I was, you know, second year of high school, walking in front of a class, and this kid that would have been perpetually bullying me, like, tripped me, and I just lost it. And I had this big, like, math or biology book or something, like how you would throw a discus. I just coiled back and hit him across the face as hard as I could with it. He flipped out of his chair. Just as the moment the teacher walked in the door, and I still remember it today. Like, I, it was all these emotions of like, yeah, and the emotions of like, oh, shit. <laughs> and, and like, I'm dead when I come back to school. But anyway, he grabbed me by the, the hand, and I don't think my feet touched the ground, like even two steps to the principal's office. And there's no um, violence policy, so I was suspended for a week. You know, I had my dad came and picked me up, and he said, did he deserve it? I'm like, yes. And he's like, OK, don't do it again. <laughs> but uh, when I came back to school, like, wow, I had this new respect. All the stoners and freaks and the bad, the smokers, they're like, you're, you're pretty cool. And I, you know, I'm being a smart kid. I'm like, OK, yeah, if I'm a little wild and crazy, people leave me alone. So I really embrace this wild and crazy. Grades went to zero. I had the lowest GPA in school, got all gothy, you know, Doc Martens, the whole thing. But I, um, I just did everything I could to just kind of give this air of like badassery. And uh, got me into a lot of trouble, but also opened up some opportunities. Around the same time, I also ran into some uh, other mentors that were really important in my life. Um, two ham radio operators that I met at the local library. Yeah, ham radio operators. 30 years later, I got my ham license. I'm a ham now. Um, met them at our little tiny library. Um, one day, I was looking at the three books on electronics that they had there. And they're like, hey, kid, are you into electronics? And I'm like, yeah. And uh, they're like, hey, come over, take a look at my ham shack. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was awesome. Uh, they took me over to their ham shacks. You know, one guy had like an old storage shed in the backyard. He converted it into his electronic dungeon with like heat kit oscilloscopes. And he had a VIC-20 hooked up so he could do RTTY. Like, wow, these old farts are really cool. They uh, have computers hooked to radios, which I like. And of course, I tell them about all my pirate radio stuff, which they're like, <sighs> All you got to do is learn Morse code. <laughs> yeah. And then you can get a license and talk to people around the world legitimately. And I'm like, Morse code's lame. Come on. It's more fun to broadcast you know, rock and roll. But it was great. They were very helpful. They um, gave me some of my first like, real good gear, like oscilloscopes, so I could retire my old black and white television that I turned into an oscilloscope. And uh, like real soldering irons, not the, uh, the ones that are soft as a potato. And taught me a lot of fundamentals about electronics. I'm really humbled today because I was just a snot-nosed kid with a lot of like chips on my shoulder. You know, and I never, I don't think I really thanked them at the time. Right? Um, and now they're all gone. Right? And that makes me really sad. So if you have a mentor, thank them now before it's too late. Um, so I'm a gothy, weird, wild kid, and the more wild and crazy I am, the more people leave me alone, and more people respect me, and like I'm moving up the status, and living in this small community, there's a lot of little racetracks, little dirt racetracks, and my father would go out there occasionally, and he even built a, like, a jalopy car at some point, and I'm like, whoa, that is, there's nothing more wild than building, a, you know, racing cars, and so I'm like, at this point, I'm working full-time at my father's gas station. And he's, 
you know, I'm 16 or so probably. You know, he had taught me everything. I was lapping valves and pulling heads off and changing oil and doing stuff like that. And totally immersed into automotive things. And I'm like, Dad, build me a race car. I want to race. I want to race. And he's like, no, you're going to kill yourself. I will not build you a race car. So just like how I got my Commodore 64, I pestered him and pestered him and pestered him. And finally, he, um, he's like, OK, you know, this is, this is the agreement I'll, I'll make with you. If you can save up enough money to buy a race car or build one yourself, you can race. And I'm like, well, I'm never going to be able to save up to buy a race car. They look really expensive. So I started going to the racetrack like every weekend. And after the races, you could sneak into the pits. And that's, I think that's where I first learned how to like, uh, uh, sneak into places, which became very valuable later in my career. Uh, my legit career, too. Just <laughs> Um, so I'd go and I'd talk to all these racers, and I'm like, I'm really, really interested in this, and like, how do you build a race car? And they started telling me things like, yeah, I get this book, and I'll, I'll bring you the address that you can send 50 bucks off to and get a book or whatever, VHS tapes. And I started like totally immersing myself in race cars. So a year before I even built a car, I'd just dog-eared this book, and I'd watch the VHS tape until it was just like static. I'm like, okay, I got it. I can do this, but I don't know how to weld. I don't know how to machine things. So I went around town, and we lived in a logging community. So there were a handful of machine shops there. And this is where another mentor comes in that really um, changed the direction in my life. Um, he had a, a one-person machine shop by himself most of the day, and except for when clients would come in. And I'm like, please, I'd like to learn how to machine so I can build a race car. He's like, I'll make a deal with you. You can come in on Saturday, but you've got to work. And so I'd get there. I'd ride my bike. I lived like 10 miles out of town. I'd ride my bike all the way. Well, no, I had my car then. Yeah, I guess I had my car. Um, so I'd, I'd come in, and uh, he would just work me to, to the bone. Um, I'd be, he'd like stuff me in the bed of his lathe. He's like, crawl under there and like clean the chips out. And now you're going to grease the... Uh, the, the ways on the lathe, and, and it, towards the end of the day, he'd grab a piece of scrap metal, like, okay, we're going to MIG weld today, you know, and he'd teach me how to weld, and well, today we're going to learn how to power tap holes on the lathe. This guy was amazing, um, and, and this is where I learned about mentors, where you, when you have this virtuous cycle with them, where you really appreciate this wisdom they have that maybe they have no outlets for, they, they will go bend over backwards to teach you what they know. And that was his case. Like, he was just so willing to teach and blow tons of his money, like power tapping a hole with a lathe. Like, you know, a 16, 17-year-old kid's going to snap the, the, the tap off the first time you go. And, you know, you're like, OK, do it. And so I'd jam that tap in there, and it'd immediately snap off. And he'd be like, oh, god damn it. And like, he'd throw his hands up. And then I'd look, be like, look back, and he'd have like kind of a little wry smile on his face. Um, it was amazing. Like, you have to make those mistakes, and sometimes you run into mentors that will let you make mistakes on their dime. And even in your career, right, I found that, like, your first jobs, a lot of times you have to make your mistakes on the job and blow a lot of other people's money. Um, so, yeah, this was pretty amazing. I built my first race car. I sucked at it. I was uh, last in points. I, um, first time I went out to race, I was the slowest time of the night by two um, two minutes. It was like really embarrassing, bad. But um, I had this book uh, to teach me how to build race cars, and in the back there was a phone number and an address to the person that wrote it. So I started calling this guy, calling him, calling him. And he's like, Yeah, you know, why don't you just, if you can get to Florida, and I lived in Oregon, just stay with me and my wife for a couple weeks, and I'll teach you everything you know, need to know about racing. And I'm like, yeah. So I get on a Greyhound bus at 17 or something and take this five-day trip out with skeezy people, <laughs> you know, doing like unthinkable, unthinkable things towards me um, to stay with this guy. And uh, it was amazing. Like the first few days, he taught me everything I needed to know about the dynamics and statics of a race car. And then... There was, wasn't much more to learn at that point. But after that, he's like, 
psychology of racing. He's like, that's more important than how good your race car is. Like, you can become a great race car driver and drive a crappy car and compensate for it, but your real edge is psychology. And so he taught me, he told me a lot of like really funny stories I'll tell you after if you want to hear about like things that we do to get into people's heads. And of course I came back the next year and the racing season started up and like, okay, I'm gonna start doing some of these things. Things like during a yellow flag condition on dirt ovals, you know, there's a lot of contact because you're bouncing around on the dirt and stuff. And he's like, just accidentally hit people a lot during yellow flags. You know, and, and if you see their head, you know, doing this, you've rattled them and you're gonna gobble them up, right? Or pull up alongside them and just during a yellow flag, point back, say like, you belong back there. Because like when there's a crash, there's a lot of confusion of where people belong and the flagger is more worried about like trying to um, deal with the first three or four cars to get them in the right order and so you can get a free spot and you know, stuff like that. Uh, I took it one step further. I was into electronics, pretty advanced at this point. So I started doing things like building my own traction control system for the car, which is awesome. Um, I dominated. I started dominating. I uh, ended up uh, getting like sponsors from British Petroleum to pay for it all. I was tur touring up and down um, I-5, dropped out of high school. Like, why would I be there when I'm like winning $10,000 on a weekend? It's like, <laughs> so I ended up dropping out of high school. Um, that was pretty fun and, uh, and also a tiny bit frustrating because of the knuckleheads I had to race with, but I, was, I did quite well. Um, lots of stories there. Um, but, you know, I started to get my head straightened out at this point. Like, I'm in, out in the real world and I'm like, hey, you know, I, uh, you know, I don't have to be so wild and crazy. People are treating me pretty good and, like, this racing thing's pretty hard. And, so uh, I went over to a friend's house who was also a high school friend and now he had started his career and started his family and everything and he had his garage man cave and in there was a 486 computer that he built and he had tricked a retail or a wholesaler for computer parts to sell him parts wholesale and he's like, yeah, this computer cost me like $600. Normally it's like twelve to $1,400 and like, whoa, that's like good margin without having to like scar your hands up welding and stuff like that. So I'm like, hey, I'll fund this business. Let's start it, open a computer store because everyone's getting on AOL at this point and it's like people are selling computers like crazy. And so we opened the store. He was working as a locksmith and he um, had to keep his day job because he had a kid and everything like that. And he's like, well, once the store's, you know, going well enough, then I'll join and then we'll just happily ever after, right? So we get the store going, I'm running the store, I sold off all my racing stuff, get out of it completely, store takes off, and then he um, quits his job. And of course, I'm still, I'm really edgy at this point. We start butting heads like this, just constantly, constantly. And so it came to a head, and he got a lawyer and booed me out of the business, so I lost everything. It was really tragic. I, I remember being in the back of the store just like weeping and the person I was dating at the time was up front yelling at him like, I can't believe you did this to her. Um, so I, I go home and go to my apartment and um, I'm just kind of sobbing and upset and I start calling around and um, I called my father and friends and all of them are like, okay, you had a good run on racing, you had a good run on the computer store, just go to school, get your GED, and then go to college, do the safe thing. No, no, <laughs> would I do that? No, I got pissed off. So um, I called up my landlord, like, will you uh, let me break the lease so I can get my deposit back? And yeah, I managed to finagle a little bit of money. I took every penny I had. I rented a uh, little storefront, which was a barber shop, set up business in there and threw the barber chair out the back, which mysteriously disappeared a few weeks later, and, uh, and started um, selling computers. But I had no money to buy the components, so I would go to my ex-business partner's uh, dumpster and get all the colorful boxes out and put them all over the wall. <laughs> and then, yeah, it sounds like a Silicon Valley startup, fake it till you make it, right? Um, so people would come in and they would, uh, like, I want the Sound Blaster card. I'd be like, well, that one's taken, but if you give me the money, I can get it for you in a couple days. And, and that's how I kind of bootstrapped the business. And the time I was living in the back of the computer store, this one right here, 
And um, living on ramen noodles, getting super skinny, because I just didn't have, you know, I would sacrifice food to get computer parts and stuff like that. Um, that's when another mentor entered my life. Um, he was a business owner that was across the street. And he came over and would get, bring me lunch, which was great. And then he started telling me about things like relatability. He's like, you know, you need to look, you know, the part. You need to, like, people aren't going to trust, like, a gothy, you know, lady selling them uh, computer parts. And I admired him, and I'm like, okay. Um, and so I started dressing the part, and like, wow, things started taking off and exploding. Ended up opening five stores. Always had pinballs and retro computers in them because I'm a nerd, and it was a wonderful time. Made lots of money until year 2000. And then the computer store market imploded. Um, but that was a great experience for me. I learned how to hire and fire um, people, how to run a business, do taxes, everything you need to do to run a business, um, how to hire the right people. That was a hard lesson to learn in the early days. Um, and it served me well even today. People that are passionate, hire them immediately. Hire them immediately. Yeah. So then now we move into a little bit more modern uh, times. Uh, computer stores failed. Um, I'm working an odd job at an electronic store, um, shuffling transistors and battery um, boxes out to uh, hobbyists, um, trying to stay alive. And I went to my uh, father and asked him, like, well, what should I do? And he's like, well, you had a good run with the computer stores and the racing and what, go back to school. And, you know, then go to college, get your life on track, kid. <laughs> it's like, I'm like, nah. <laughs> And at this point, through the computer stores, now I'm getting into FPGAs, because I had money, yeah, FPGAs, microcontrollers, learned how to do my own circuit boards. I'm like, I think I can make a go in Silicon Valley. Um, so I started flying down to events, events like this, right? And this comes into the sneaking in part. I don't think I ever snuck into a vintage computer festival, but there were a lot of events I snuck into because I didn't have money to pay the expensive t ticket. Turns out, if you look the part, <laughs> you can just walk right in the door, have a clipboard, just right on in, or whatever, just look like you're, you're on a mission. But I started uh, coming to events, meeting these people I'd only read about you know, in magazines. Ran into Bill Hurd, just amazing. And I'd sit in an audience like this in just complete awe, like, wow, someday. Someday I'll be able to do something exciting as like the stories they're telling. But and then I was interviewing, I was meeting people like, hey, you know, I, I carried a duffel bag with me um, that had little circuit boards. Like, well, here's a little FPGA video generator I made. This one does sound. This one drives an LCD, which was difficult at the time, and, and a processor I built. And meeting founders and various people, and they're like, oh, come on in and interview. This looks really good. And I just did dozens of interviews, and they always ended the same way. You'd make it one or two interviews in, and they'd be like, ooh, interesting race cars, computer stores, and you have a lot of reference designs of things you built here, but where'd you go to school? <laughs> like, well, I'm actually a high school dropout, and they're like, out you go. But I did get my first break. Um, it was pretty exciting. So this um, gentleman I may, met, he's like, you just seem like you're the right you know, amount of crazy for us. And he's like, come interview. And at this point, I'm completely broke and working for minimum wage, living in Portland. Back doing the Greyhound bus thing because I couldn't afford like a $200 plane ticket. And I come down, I do the interview. They cut me off early. I'm walking down the stairs out of their facility. And I met him coming up the stairs. And he's like, where are you going? Like, well, they cut me off early. And he's like, what? Well, did you talk to so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so? And I'm like, no, no, I only talked to like one or two people. And he's like, come with me. And he pulled me back up the stairs. He got all the engineering team, did a panel interview, unilaterally hired me. And I'm like, okay, this is my chance. And I just like, I worked day and night. And thankfully for like events like this, I had mentors now down here that had done a lot of exciting things that I could call. I was pestering my friends. Like, I got to build this like, I forget what processor, a board to drive their ultra wideband chip. I'm really, oh. <laughs> But, you know, I think it goes back to my father, goes back to living in back of the computer stores, struggling um, in race cars. You know, I knew how to work extra hard. And so I was just up 24 hours a day, 
And I got the design done and it worked and they liked it and that was my stepping stone. And from there, that opened a lot of other opportunities where I would just go in and do some designs. And then I started to collect people around me who were kind of like people who would follow me from projects and started to get a little bit of a reputation of like, you have a problem, call Jerry, she can help you like get a team together and you know, she'll get you something that works. Led, it just kept me alive and kept me moving forward. My first job down here, by the way, was for $15 an hour. He saw me coming, but I still appreciate it. But that led to a bunch of other exciting things. I got to work on like bipedal robots. I got to sleep in the office, like <laughs> navigation systems for low Earth orbit rockets that occasionally blow up. Um, but probably for many of you that are here, you may have heard about the Commodore DTV. This is where things really um, broke open for me. This is, was a dream project. I had been reverse engineering the Commodore 64 chipset. Um, I had it working in FPGA and this company uh, out of New York, a toy company, had been trying to make a Commodore um, all in one joystick so you could play your favorite um, video games. And uh, they were trying to do it with like processors, but you know, Commodore's hard to emulate on a processor in 2003. It would cost way too much for a toy and they're like, we heard about you and that you, you know, have reverse engine, can you make an ASIC for us? And I'm like, took a deep gulp and like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> so like, okay, we have to have it done in a year and it's you know July, we have to be in manufacturing, so go. And so I reached out to some folks in the retro community because we had to write some software for this thing. It's like, can you, you know, help on the software? They'd already identified some software people and I started working on this ASIC. I'd never done an ASIC before, but thanks to all the mentors, and maybe even some of you out here that um, helped me through that process, but worked 24 hours a day. I didn't realize how long it took to make an ASIC. It takes a long time. So for a full year, I didn't get much sleep. I built, first thing is an FPGA emulator for the software people, getting the design done. We didn't even have color video until two weeks before tape out. I kept telling the software people, trust me, it'll be there. Trust me, trust me. And we're running behind schedule. The toy guys are getting freaked out and they're like, you know, two weeks, it's go time. We're building this chi chip. We don't even have time for sample chips. So we're just building all of them. So boom, they, they send it out to the fab. They build them. A couple weeks later, they, they land out in, and this was a metallized gate array. So kind of in between an ASIC and an FPGA, a hardened FPGA kind of thing. They uh, send it off to the factory. The factory bonds them up, chip on board, and then I get this angry call from the toy guy. And he's like, they didn't work. Like, what are you gonna do to fix this? And I'm like scared. Like, I just blew millions of dollars of this guy's money. Um, maybe I should run to Mexico and hide. <laughs> it's actually went through my mind. And so, no, I ended up, I had never left the United States at this point even. I had to get a passport expedited like in two days. They flew me to San Francisco to walk, hand walk it through. And on a plane to China, I'd never been to any foreign place before, put me on a bus, take me over to China. I get to the factory, great experience. I'm like, wow, my goodness, this is so crazy. And we get there and they have like the first 200 units and we open one of them up and I look at it and the circuit board is not the circuit board layout that I sent to them. And I'm like, what is this? And of course, thanks to the ham radio operators, they're like, your best debug tool in electronics is your finger. So I start pushing on the board and they're like, bloop, ready. I'm like, oh, I'm saved. And so quickly we relayed out the board and we got it out the door and great. All right, the, product, uh, the project saved and I'm not gonna be ax murdered by an angry New Yorker. And, um, so they start building these things and I'm hanging out in China and I'm on the production line and I drop into the secret menu inside the, um, the joystick and one of the toy guys were there and saw me drop into the secret menu with the secret games and pictures of me and the programmers drinking beer with Jim Butterfield and they're like, what is this? I'm like, oh, we added a few things. And they're like, you did what? Like, there's ratings for child's toys. Like you have pictures of you drinking beer and that one game, Cliff Diver, you have to drop onto the rocks below and smash your head into the rocks the best way to get the highest points. So I, oops. So I go home and my answering machine is 
full of angry me messages from this toy executive, like, you're done in the business. You're done. I should sue you. I should sue you. I'm like, oh, my god. And the guy I was dating at the time, he's like, well, if you're do done in the toy industry, you know, no one's going to find this thing unless we tell them about it. So you might as well just like let the world know. And he was good with like faking websites. So he made this fake website as it was a Chinese factory worker who um, liked to hack things <laughs> in a bunch of backdated posts of other hacks he had done. Somehow he got it on the front of Slashdot. And so then my answering machine is filling up with angry messages from the toy executive, like, I know this is you, totally going to sue you. Like, oh my god. And then they ended up uh, selling this, the first batch of these on QVC. And so they had forgotten to take me off some of the email threads. So launch day comes midnight. I'm sitting there watching. And every hour, you get a message of how many units have sold. And it's like 10,000. And it's midnight. And it's like, starts getting into the next day during like North America hours. And it's like 40,000. And like they sold out in a week. It was pretty amazing. But I was also on some threads where the QVC folks were like, we don't understand what's going on with this. Like, we're only advertising this domestically, and over 50% of these are going overseas. <laughs> so yeah. And uh, I, did, I went on to do five other toys with him. He loved me. And he's like, actually, we had, he called me kiddo all the time. He called me up like a few weeks later. Way to go, kiddo. <laughs> Never do that again. <laughs> i got to expedite the story here a little bit. So I had a great opportunity to go work at Valve Software. It's a video game company. Um, they were threatened by Microsoft not to be able to sell games on the platform at Windows 8. They needed to find a way to um, get into the living room, make a game console, or some way to sell games. Because Valve sells um, everybody's games on PC. And if they can't sell on Windows, they're doomed. Their business disappears overnight. It was pretty amazing. So they gave me. It's a fun story. I'll tell you offline. But they, they gave me an unlimited budget. They let me hire anybody I wanted. I put together this dream team. It was really fun. We researched everything about gaming. And now I'm totally steeped in, in toys and entertaining people. And um, we researched how to bring people together in the living room. And actually, HTC Vive, that headset was our project. We gave that. We seeded Oculus. We did game consoles, which flopped because it was a repeat of 3DO, and I told them that, and a bunch of other interesting things. But I had developed this really cool augmented reality um, technology there um, that used this special optical technique. And I'm like, Gabe, you hired me to bring the family together. This does it. And they're like, well, you know, the threat's gone, and like we're kind of hardcore. VR is the direction we're going to go. We're going to cut the AR team. So they ended up firing all of us, letting us go in a like big, one big swell, uh, swoop. And uh, I was so mad about this and upset because I really, really wanted to bring the family together in holograms and Princess Leia, all of that. I dreamed of that. And I had actually achieved it there. And so yeah, they have a rule at Valve, um, whoever hires you, fires you, so, which I think is a really cool rule. Um, so I was fired by Gabe. So. Um, I get the message, come see Gabe, and I'm like, well, here it is. And so I, I pump myself up. I'm like, going to give him a piece of my mind about this. I walk in the door, and that I said something kind of aggressive, and then immediately dropped into tears, like, oh, I can't believe you're doing this, and just all the emotions washing across me. And um, anyway, we had a nice little talk, and you know, he corporate speak nonsense. And uh, then as I was walking out the door. Um, I just kind of turned to him. I'm like, you should just sell me that technology. And he's like, OK. So I'm like, wow, that's amazing. So I ran downstairs, uh, really weird layoff process. They let us hang around the building all day. Um, I grabbed a couple people. I'm like, do you want to do this? And so we bought the technology. Um, started a company called Cast AR with it, my first venture-backed startup. And wow, did I learn everything to do wrong in a startup. <laughs> um, I only have three minutes here, but you know I'm going to try to summarize what happened quickly. Um, I should have listened to my mentors. Like I was talking to people as we we're founding this company. Like you have the vision, you should lead the company, and I was too scared. Probably the first time in my career, I was too scared to go like boldly do something. So I got an external CEO who wasn't too bad, 
And then we got this huge amount of money from a venture capitalist who is a moonshot venture capitalist, as he would say, moonshot this. And so immediately our CEO is more pragmatic and actually an operator of a business and less of a fluff and dump um, operator. Um, so they start butting heads, they kick him out. Now I'm on the board by myself, all VCs sitting across from me. They start installing Disney executives and Sony executives and like that. $15 million crater in the ground, just poof, money was gone. So uh, these illustrious executives that blew all the money weren't even there to liquidate and shut down the business. They just left it up to me, right? And I'm sitting in the office, distraught, sea of cubicles with no one in it, all my friends gone, and a product that's really cool and works. And Nolan Bushnell calls me which I barely know Nolan, but I get this phone call and it's like, it's Nolan. I'm like, Nolan who? Nolan Bushnell. And he's like, I could see this coming a mile away. He's like, he gave me a little pep talk and he, the thing he left me with is like, I've had a lot of failures in my life, that doesn't end you. Like, this is so good, you just need to figure out how to make it happen, just go figure it out. And I'm like, well, if Nolan says so, I guess I need to go figure it out. I, but it was the catalyst I needed at that moment. And so I called up some of our most trusted people in the company, including Amy, who's here, my co-founder. And, like, and I reached out to a bunch of mentors who told me, like, yeah, you can actually buy your stuff back again. <laughs> and, and, and that's what we did. We bought the technology back, started the company till five. We've been going for six years. Um, it works really well, and it's all about group gaming in the living room, and it's, it's really amazing uh, and fun, and I'm leading the company, and it turns out being a CEO is not that hard. <laughs> it's not that hard at all. Great team. Uh, we like to swear a lot. Um, we're doing a promo video this week that has about 10 F-bombs in it. <laughs> People love the product. Um, but it's funny, as I raise money for the company, I hear this a lot, Jerry doesn't pattern match a founder we don't want to put money in. It's like, I don't know. You know, maybe that's a good thing that I don't pattern match a founder, even though I've run lots of businesses and delivered millions and millions of products. So um, I think I want to at end, I think I'm right at the end. Oh, perfect, perfect. I timed this perfectly. Um, I just want to end with something that I was thinking about on the way in. Um, Sitting in an audience like this, I, I never really grokked that someday I would be up here and my stuff would be vintage. <laughs> so, someone just walked up at the start of this with one of the Commodore joysticks and that's pushing close to 20 years. I, I've become vintage. <laughs> it's cool, it's really cool and it'll happen to you unfortunately too. So with that, I think I'm gonna stop here. <laughs>